welcome to Real uh, on primary markets. We'll wait a moment while people join. Okay, let's get started. Um, hello again, and welcome to the first half of 2023 primary market review. Um, interest coverage ratio squeezed as issuers tackle maturities, in which we'll be discussing the key developments uh, in the primary leveraged finance market um, this year to date and expectations for the rest of the year. Um, we will be answering questions at the end of the, the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions um, so at any time during the webinar uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, so I'll get started by introducing our panel today. My name is Beatrice Mavroli. I'm a senior reporter covering leverage finance, coming, covering performing credit. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Charlie Ward, um, who's a credit analyst uh, on our EMEA team. Hello, Charlie. How are you? Good morning. Very good. Excellent. Um, and we're also joined by Brian Conway, uh, a senior legal analyst on our EMEA covenants group. Um, hi, Brian. How are you? Hi, Beatrice. Very good. Thank you. Both Brian and Charlie are actively involved in coverage of, for our EMEA core and covenant products. Welcome to both of you. Um, Charlie will be covering the key trends that we have observed in um, the high yield bond market first um, in the first half of the year, and then he'll move, to, move on to the leveraged, um, leveraged loan market um, to describe the, the trends that we've seen there. Uh, Brian will then provide an overview of the trends and developments we've seen in covenants. Um, uh, but before we start, I'd just like to mention a few bits of housekeeping. Um, if, you, if you'd like access to this webinar again, a, a replay will be available on Reorg's website um, in the web, webinars and podcast page later today for Reorg subscribers. Um, and um, for those of you who've joined um, us on one, one of our deep dive webinars before, you'll see that today uh, Reorg's full trifecta is represented. Um, since it, the beginning, Reorg has prided itself on its uh, combination of journalistic, financial and legal expertise, which allow us, uh, allows us to give our subscribers a holistic view of uh, the situations that we cover. So uh, let's get started today with, uh, with today's deep dive. Um, Charlie, um, coming to you first, can you begin by providing us with some insight into what's been going on in the bond, bond market? Uh, yeah, sure. And thanks for the introduction, Beatrice. So uh, the most obvious takeaway from our analysis of the bond market in the first half of the year is that the issuance volume that was recorded uh, actually signaled the reopening of the high yield market. And this is in comparison to the effective closure that we observed in 2022. I think we're all aware that that was as a resu result of uh, increasing macroeconomic uncertainty, which uh, was as a result or partially as a result of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the resulting inflationary pressures from that across Europe, which spun into a European cost of living crisis. And then uh, the resulting uncertainty over the trajectory of rates um, and to quantify the change from 2022 to 2023, um, there was an 115% uh, increase in issuance volumes for the first half of 2023 compared to the same period of 2022. Um, and that's for a total issuance volume for the first half of 33 billion in the high yield bond market. Uh, and as we can observe on the chart on screen, issuance volumes actually ramped up significantly in April and then peaked in May for a total volume of around 11 billion. Um, now this coincided with the publication of the Eurozone and UK inflation statistics, which came in uh, sort of above expectations or uh, it became clear that they were gonna be sticky. Um, and this resulted in a change of tone of central bank communications, signal signaling that further rate rises may be required and that elevated rates are here for at least the foreseeable future. Um, those base rate rises came on May 10th and 11th uh, for the ECB and the Bank of England, respectively. And so a lot of issuers were actually hasty to come to market prior to those official announcements, um, which was actually why we saw the majority of that 11 billion volume in May um, come in the first week of May before the initial announcements. Um, now, this chart on screen puts the uh, issuance volume for the first half of 2023 into perspective. It shows the total volumes from uh, quarter one, 2021, up until the end of quarter two, 2023. Um, and we can see that issuance volumes have actually been significantly lower 
in comparison to 2021. Uh, obviously, compared to 2022, it's not really any comparison at all because the market shut in the second quarter of 2022. Um, and the fact that there's far lower issuance volumes actually reflects that the era of cheap money is over, as I said, for the foreseeable future. And so it's actually been significantly more difficult um, to construct deals in the high yield market that uh, issuers are happy with and investors will be receptive to. Um, one additional takeaway that we can see from the chart on screen is that um, all these bars here are split between uh, the rating category with B in dark blue, uh, double B in red and triple C in light blue, uh, which was only present in uh, 2021. Um, and you can see there that the split of um, single B in 2021 was actually far higher in comparison to 2023. And this sort of embodies the superior credit metrics that issuers are coming to market with in 2023. Um, and as you can see in 2021, actually some issuers were able to come to market with issuances that were rated triple C um, at the point of inception, which is not a trend that I imagine you would see in 2023, given the level of investor concern still with the macroeconomic certainty um, and the elevated yields that a triple C issuer would be experiencing in the high yield market. Uh, to give perspective on uh, the superior credit metrics or how credit metrics vary between uh, a double B and a single B issuer in the 2023 market, uh, the average of the net leverage uh, issuance of issuers rated double B was three times in 2023. That's compared to an average of 5.1 times um, for single B issuances. Um, and as such, you can imagine there's quite significant investor caution. Uh, to participate in issuances which are accompanied by a two-turn increase in leverage, especially, as I said, with uncertainty over um, the macroeconomic situation in Europe. Um, so we can say that uh, investor appetite for the high-yield bond market has indeed returned in 2023. Um, however, we can caveat that by saying that this is largely only for those issuers which have high-quality metrics, and we'll move on to yields later, but those with lower high quality, high, lower credit metrics um, do have to offer highly elevated yields. Um, so we can see that double B issuers uh, were able to price their issuances at um, around 6.9% on average, uh, and that's yield to maturity at issuance. This is in comparison to single B rated issuers that were required to price their issuer, issuances at 8.7%. So you can see that if you take the example of a standard refinancing, um, a single B rated issuer coming to the high yield bond market is going to be required to pay or price at uh, 180 basis points or 1.8% uh, additional yield in compared to a double B. So this might be why in the higher uh, rate environment, you see those issuers with higher quality credit metrics actually coming forward more than um, the lower quality credit metric issuances. Yeah, um, Charlie, that makes a lot of sense. It, it's kind of, um, it mirrors what I've been hearing from investors in the market, um, that basically a lot of recent debt issuance uh, signals and acceptance that higher interest rates are most likely here to stay uh, longer than was previously expected, which means that many issuers um, decided that simply it makes more sense to de-risk by refinancing now. Um, even if it has to be at, at a coupon that's higher than they would have liked, um, rather than waiting for rates to decline, which we don't know when it's going to happen, um, and risk moving closer to maturity and potentially getting to a point where they urgent, urgently need to refinance, but primary markets are effectively shut. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one investor I spoke to recently, he, he, he put it like this, he said, for, for months uh, after the start of the war in Ukraine, um, investors were waiting for a, a normalization of the primary market, and now that seems to have sort of happened. But the risk seems to have shifted to the macroeconomic outlook with high inflation and, and high interest rates. Of course, you know, last week's news that the UK inflation in June fell more than it than was expected. It was positive, but coupons will probably stay high for, for quite a while. Um, one example of this was... Um, of an issuer that, that expected to price it debt, its debt at a lower coupon, but had to accept high rates was um, the uh, German PVC window manufacturer Profine. Um, it's a B2B rated issuer. 
Um, and earlier this month, month, they priced a 380 million um, note, um, senior secured note at par to pay 9.375% to refinance its existing notes and fund a shareholder distribution. Um, and the company has had strong performance. They've, um, uh, they've had recent uh, ratings upgrades. Uh, and so in, in a different market and different macro context that the issuer will, will probably have expected to achieve a reduction from the 9.25% it paid on its 2025 notes um, that it was refinancing, but this wasn't possible. Um, but th the reality is in a situation like that, um, because the, the coupon that they got on the new notes is pretty similar, pretty close to what they had on, on the existing notes that they're refinancing, the um, interest costs and cash flow generation aren't going to change that much and and the whole kind of cap stack is, is sustainable basically but that isn't that isn't the case for all issuers for example we've been hearing that um there's a lo loan to bond refinancing for an issuer in the chemical sector that's currently in uh in pre-marketing where interest costs after the refinancing are likely to be pretty unsustainable um which means that the deal may struggle to gain traction yeah, and I think these elevated yields in the market are definitely uh, an issue for the issuers because they're having to price at elevated coupons or given a, a discount on the issue price. Um, however, those yields have definitely uh, attracted some investors to return to the market. Um, we can say that there actually has been healthy appetite given the elevated yields um, that they can achieve by participating in such issuances. Uh, and to reinforce this point further, um, we move away from the yield side of the deal and look at um, the upsizing and downsizing um, of issuan issuances in the first half of 2023. Um, and you can see here, uh, denoted by the light blue in the bars out or on the pie chart, that that's the number of issuances that were upsized during the marketing period. Um, so you can see in, in dark blue as well, those are issuances which stayed the same and the very small amount of two issuances that were downsized is in the red. Um, so you can see that basically over a third of total issuances were upsized um, and the majority of those came in May, um, whilst only two were actually downsized, which were the INEOS group euro and dollar notes, um, which had some peculiarities about the deal, which we won't go into now, but we wouldn't say that that was characteristic of um, a deal in the high yield market in the first half of 2023. But as a caveat to this, um, we can say that investor appetite for the high yield market in 2023 is was adequate or even above adequate given the amount of upsizing. Um, but this is only due to the level of supply in the market. The, as we said, the total volume in the first half was 33 billion, which was far below the total volume in the first half of 2021. Um, and using and looking at the maturities coming up, uh, we used Reorg's Credit Cloud platform, and we calculated that there are 52 billion of high yield bonds uh, that are maturing in the next year. And it definitely remains to be seen whether that investor appetite that we've said has been adequate to date will actually be adequate enough to see that amount um, or that upper limit of 52 billion uh, maturities, um, and they'll actually be able to refinance those in the bond market. Um, so moving on slightly, taking a look at the uh, use of issuance proceeds for the year to date, uh, previous slide. Um, we note that the primary use of proceeds uh, for the majority was uh, for straight refinancings of upcoming maturities, uh, which is shown by the dark blue there in the pie chart, that's 68%. Um, this is obviously to be expected during, uh, given that um, the demand for a company to refinance would have been bottled up during 2022. Those issuers who have come into market in 2022, as we'll go on to later, were having to refinance at hugely elevated yields, um, and that was largely out of necessity. However, those issuers um, that were coming to market now, as we've said, are largely just to refinance maturities. However, um, there was some LBO and acquisition related activity uh, denoted by the red here on the bars and the pie chart. Um, however, this was very limited. There was some small activity during March and April um, with uh, a pretty large LBO coming in May, uh, as well as uh, acquisition related activity. Um, and we can imagine that this is probably being muted given the fact that the market is just getting back, on to, back up to speed after the closure during 2022. And also that given the elevated yields in the market that issuers are required to offer, 
um, the cash interest cost of financing acquisitions is significantly elevated in comparison to the cost in 2021. Um, now, that's a supply side effect as to why um, many issuers might not be coming to market with uh, LBOs and acquisition based issuances. Um, however, on the demand side, investors are probably less likely to participate in an expansionary acquisition based offering. Um, given the macroeconomic uncertainty at the moment, which could cast a cloud over the long-term success of such transactions. Yeah, um, this is this is this trend is exactly what I've noted from conversations that I've had this year. Um, investors agree that it's going to take time for, for the leverage buyout activity to return to what was previously normal. Um, private equity firms expect valuations for their portfolio companies to be in line with what they acquired them for, and they're still um, the buyers and sellers are still struggling to agree on valuations. Um, however, the, this mismatch is, is people are saying it's starting to improve. Um, the, the market expects to take private LBOs um, to come shortly after the summer, which will follow the 1 billion euro um, financing uh, loan for uh, the take private of um Software, the acquisition of uh, software group Software AG by uh, Silverlake. Um, so, so yeah, which is in the market at the moment. Uh, back to you, Charlie. Yeah, so moving forward, uh, as mentioned, we'll be taking a look at the average yields to maturity that issuers have had to offer investors to incentivize them to participate in the high yield market. Um, so the chart on screen shows the total issuance volume of just fixed rate notes. Uh, from the first quarter of 2021 to the end of 2023. And overlaid with that is the average yield to maturity that those issuances priced with in the given quarter. So, for example, in quarter two, 2023, there you can see there was 16.2 um, billion um, and the average yield of those issuances at maturity um, was 7.84%. So we took fixed rate notes as a subset as they avoid the complications in pricing at issuance that floating rates that floating rate notes have. And we're really just trying to take a snapshot of the market at each of these quarters when trying to illustrate this point. Um, and as we can see, the yield to maturity at issuance in the first quarter of 2021 stood at around 4.24%, um, and has since risen significantly to 7.84% for fixed rate issuances in the last quarter. Um, and this incorporates the effect of the nine consecutive rate hikes, hikes that occurred um, from the ECB and the 13 from the Bank of England that occurred from that period onwards. Um, another key takeaway is actually that yield to maturity at issuance um, peaked in the third quarter of 2022 at 10.39%, um, which was due to the effective uh, closure of the high yield market during this period. Uh, and as a result, those issuers who actually came to market, despite often having high quality credit metrics, had to offer highly elevated yields uh, in order to secure financing, given that the market was largely closed due to the uh, macroeconomic shock of uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and this is a trend that we expect would return if the market was closed again. Um, you have to offer a very high yield to investors to get them to participate in an offering, even if your credit metrics are good and you have a rel relatively robust business. Um, an example of this was uh, UK consumer credit provider New Day. Um, they refinanced at a really burdensome 13.25% uh, via an exchange offer. Uh, and another example is also UK headquartered uh, gambling group 888 Holdings, um, who actually managed to keep their cash interest burden low um, by tapping their 7.5 or 7.6% notes. However, that was done at a discounted price of 84.5%. Uh, which is a huge OID, far far larger than anything we've seen in 2023. Um, and this resulted in a yield to maturity at issuance for investors willing to participate of 12%. Um, so that was an example where um, a company was able to get slightly creative in order to keep cash interest burden the same, um, to secure additional financing whilst offering investors who hold the notes to maturity um, a very attractive yield. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, we also took a look um, in terms of yields of the sector trends uh, in the high yield market. And we noticed a few interesting things and a few disparities between different sectors. Um, so it basically issue, issuances in sectors which are exposed to cyclicality 
like the automotive sector, were actually um, being priced uh, at very high yields despite the their relatively low leverage. Um, so German automotive uh, component manufacturer Bentler um, actually priced a 500 million tranche at 10.5%, as you can see here as outlined at the very end of the yield to maturity at issuance um, axis. And you can also see um, that was priced at 9.4%, um, which actually reflected uh, a first time issuer premium. And sorry, that 9.4% was on uh, the Euro tranche. Um, but another German auto automotive manufacturer, Adler Pelzer, um, also came to market with the highest yield that we saw uh, in the year to date, which was 12%, um, which was on, a, on account of a pretty large OID of 7.5 points, which was uh, the highest of any high yield issuance in 2023. But this was also combined with an elevated 9.5% coupon, which um, is, is obviously quite burdensome in terms of cash interest. Um, so we can infer that given the automotive sector's um, high exposure to changes in consumer demand, um, they were actually required to offer investors far high yields, um, despite the relatively uh, low leverage um, of issuers in that sector. Um, and investors who are betting on the resilience uh, of the automotive sector to a decline in consumer demand are actually able to achieve yields far above the 7.99% average yield to maturity of all these issuers issuances in the year to date. Um, so if you have an alternative view where you think autos may not decline, these were good bets if you want to hold these to maturity. Um, and on the other side of the cyclicality point, uh, we can look at issuers from the telecom sector, which is shown here as a subset of TMT. Um, and we've not broken them out here, but you can see circled here, Telecom Italia uh, came to market with uh, a B-rated senior secured issuance at 6.9%, um, and was actually able later to tap its unsecured for the notes for the same rate. And that was done again uh, two weeks ago, I believe. Uh, you can see here that it's relatively, its net leverage is relatively high. However, its yield to maturity at issuance is also quite low, definitely below the halfway point here. Um, and the same is true for French telecom operator Iliad, which was actually able to refinance its term facility by issuing notes paying only 5.8%, despite, as you can see there, sitting relatively in the middle of the, um, the leverage chart that we have here. Um, and conversely, um, the average yield to maturity for consumer discretionary issuances uh, denoted here by uh, the green dots. Uh, the dark green dots, um, they came in below the overall uh, average of yield, uh, yield to maturity at issuance, um, and they came in at an average of 7.5%. You can see that they're spread uh, from those which had a very low yield to maturity, um, which is as a result of the like peculiarities of that individual deal and those which were coming in at the higher end. Um, and there's a widespread there is obviously they were they had the highest volume of uh, any sector in the year to date. Um, however, the point that's not captured on the chart here is that those issuers in the consumer discretionary sector were actually coming to market with uh, higher quality credit metrics. Um, and 62% of those were rated double B. Um, and so uh, that's likely as a result of the previous point we explained um, where elevated yields for single B um, issuers were demanded. Um, and given that consumer discretionary names are probably this, one of the sectors apart from automotive, um, which are likely exposed to cost of living pressures and declines in demand, um, they might not have been happy to bear the impact on uh, pro forma cash interest. Um, given having to refinance at a very high rate. Uh, the point, this point about increased cash interest burden is reflected on this slide. And this is actually one of the key takeaways uh, from our analysis. Um, we've observed that for a subset of issuances for which we had uh, pricing supplements and offering memorandums, there's actually been a significant consistent decline in interest coverage ratios um, pro forma uh, for an issuance. Um, from 2020 onwards, that is. Um, and we can see here that whereas the decline was not overtly pronounced between 2020 and 2021, um, falling by um, less than a turn over two years, 
um, between 2022 and 2023 alone, um, post issuance average interest coverage ratios dropped by almost an entire turn in half a year alone. Uh, now, that's obviously a significant change, which is we will definitely be seeing filtering through for the rest of the year, potentially into the next, where issuers having to refinance um, in the elevated rate environment will certainly see um, their interest coverage ratios decline. Um, and this links into a larger point about cash interest costs in general, um, whereas if you're in the 2021 market where issuers only had to offer around 4%, to get investors to participate. Um, if you're now a lower B-rated issuer having to come to market, and if we take that the average uh, yield to maturity that a uh, issuer had to offer in 2023 for the first half, and you're B-rated, they were paying 8.7%. So you move from 4% to 8.7% to get investors to participate, and that's that your cash interest burden definitely becomes a far more significant concern. Um, so this actually concludes our analysis of the key trends in the high yield bond market. And now we'll move on to the trends that we observed in the leveraged loan market. Um, so total issuance volume uh, for the first half of 2023 uh, rose 52% year over year um, for a total issuance volume of 51.2 billion euros uh, for the first half of 2023. Um, you can see that volumes were fairly consistent uh, over uh, the entire first half of the year, uh, apart from May, which had the opposite effect uh, to the bond market, which partially may have been as a result of the preference for the bond market in that month. Um, and the total issuance volume for the first half in the loan market of 51 billion euros is obviously a significant increase on the 33 billion euro total volume of high yield bonds in the same period. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, those issuers that were coming to market in the bond market had relatively strong credit metrics with 50%, um, as I said, being rated double B. Um, however, the converse is actually true for the leveraged loan market. 66% um, of uh, the issuances in the loan market for the year to date uh, were actually rated single B, which you can see denoted by the dark blue um, on the bar. Um, and that was for a total volume of 34 billion euros uh, issued in the loan market at a single B rating. And this was more than the entire high yield bond market uh, combined. Yeah, um, leverage loan is issuance has been focused on uh, amend and extend transactions, as we all know, um, which are the preferred option for issuers that are slightly stressed or don't want to provide lenders with the, an opportunity to exit cred credits, which is what they would have in, in the case of a full refinancing. Um, two of the more challenging credits to have completed a &Es recently were um, the uh, vegetable spread manufacturer Upfield and uh, petrol station forecourt operator EG Group. Um, and this is reflected in the fact that an unextended stub of debt remained after each deal. Um, for some loan issuers, um, debt service costs after recent amendments will be hard to sustain at current earnings levels. Um, and these borrowers are kind of expected to grow into these higher interest costs by increasing EBITDA. And this may prove challenging um, in the current low growth environment. Um, this is the case for Upfield, which extended the majority of its term loan B at margins that are between 150 and 175 um, basis points higher. Um, and the higher margin on the, the company's loans will obviously uh, reduce free cash flow, make it harder for them to deleverage um, at, at a time where ba basically there's, um, there are questions about the group's performance um, and its outlook because it's under pressure to reduce uh, prices in the context of the cost of living crisis and economic uncertainty. Um, however, um, despite these um, this increase, increase in interest costs, um, investors agree that it's definitely preferable to refinance now um, rather than waiting for interest rates to decline, which may not happen soon. Um, and, you know, at the same time, risk coming closer to maturity and, and possibly the market being closed. Um, the one good example of mismanagement of um, upcoming maturities um, was is from uh, resin based uh, consumer goods manufacturer Keta, um, which postponed its refinancing in, in January last year. Um, to try to get better terms, but then it was caught out by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And now it still has um, 1.2 billion term loan B, which matures in October this year, that's basically pushing the company into restructuring despite um, improving performance. 
Um, so moving on to um, CLO issuance, um, on the demand side, um, CLO formation, which obviously drives demand for loans, has been quite slow this year, um, reflecting the challenging arbitrage um, and limited loan issuance. There was an increase in CLO issuance um, in the spring with a number of new CLOs printed by BlackRock, Anchorage and others. Um, a few debut um, CLO managers like Canyon and Signal also pri priced uh, CLOs earlier this year. Um, and there, there've been a, there's been a kind of a smattering of new CLOs uh, more recently, but there was a big gap um, in June to early July. Um, and um, so year to date, uh, 31 um, European CLOs have priced for a total volume of 11.7 billion euros. Um, of which all were new issues, according to, to JP Morgan. Um, this compares with 49 European CLOs, uh, totaling 19.8 billion uh, for the same period last year, of which 33 CLOs um, or 13.7 billion euros were new issues last year. Um, over recent weeks, um, there have been a few CLOs priced, um, and there are some warehouses around that may seem seek to uh, print over the next few months. But the, the diff difficult arbitrage and um, conditions will make it challenging. Um, and most importantly, um, it, it's difficult for them to raise equity. And uh, that means that many of them have to have equity provided internally, otherwise it becomes pretty much impossible to do it. Um, however, this, the, the current trend, obviously, for, for amend and extend transactions has been good for CLOs, providing an uptick in margins um, with no change in risk. Um, so moving on to, to Brian, um, can you give us an overview of how covenants have evolved over the first, uh, first half of the year for, for bonds and loans? Thank you, Beatrice. Um, so as you and Charlie have already discussed, the, the markets for the last six months have been dominated completely by amend and extends, refinancings and add-ons, with only a handful of new money deals. And generally, where there is an amend and extend or a refinancing of a bond or loan, the, the covenants largely follow the terms of the debt being amended or refinanced. And that's particularly the case where the, the market's unsettled. Um, and so th this is consistent with what we've seen in, in terms of covenants completed uh, for deals completed in the first half of the year. Now, most of the deals that were subject to an amend and extend or refinancing were originally done in the period from 2019 to 2021. Uh, and the covenants that we're seeing, the trends in those covenants are largely reverting back to the, the levels that we saw uh, in that period. Um, so one way I thought I could illustrate this is um, for every deal that we analyze, we produce something that we call our flex scale. And this is uh, basically where we aggregate day one baskets for debt incurrence for priming debt um, and for value leakage and payment of dividends. Uh, and so it shows uh, how much additional senior secured debt can be incurred, how much um, structurally senior debt can be incurred and where value can be leaked out. So in the two slides that uh, this slide and the next one that follows, you'll see that there's been a bit of a divergence between the, the trends in terms of capacities for bonds and loans. So the first chart here shows that the, uh, the flex scale capacities for bonds have increased um, in the first half of the year compared to, to last year. Uh, and in particular for seniors, sorry, could you go back? Uh, previous slide. So in particular for additional senior secured debt. Uh, but if we look at the next slide, we can see that capacities for, for loans have dropped and they are now more in line with, with bonds. And this is a reversal of the trend that we observed uh, last year when bonds were, or when loans were substantially higher than what we saw in bonds. Um, I expect that this, this may be actually attributable to the number of the higher proportion of issuers with strong credit metrics compared to the borrowers. Um, so overall, because of this, uh, the, the preponderance of um, amend and extends and refinancing covenants in, in bonds and loans appear to have tightened. Um, and we've seen a lot fewer deals with aggressive provisions than appeared in, at, the, at the end of 2021 at the beginning of 2022. Uh, although I think it, it's interesting to note um, about the, the 
volatility and pricing and the focus for, for issuers on pricing. And I think they're probably more than willing to, to trade off the benefit of pricing compared to flexibility that they would get with more aggressive terms. And that's probably why they're holding back a little bit, particularly where the credit matrix aren't as strong. Um, so just by way of a, a few examples of the type of provisions uh, that we're seeing less of now, pick your poison or dividend to debt toggles. Uh, this is essentially a provision which says that the borrower or issuer can use some or all of their unused restricted payment capacity uh, to, to incur debt. But in a particularly aggressive formulation, um, sorry, uh, this was, this was included in 27% of the bonds in the first half of 2023, which was down from 29% in 2022, but was only included in 20% of loans, which is down from 50% in 2022. Um, super grower baskets, uh, which provide that the fixed component of a grower basket will be adjust, adjusted upwards only to reflect increases in EBITDA also declined to 20% of um, 2023 loans, which was in line with the numbers that we saw in 2020 and 2021, but a reversal of the increase we saw in 2022. And uh, super growers also appeared in 20% 20, 20 of H1 20, uh, 2023 bond deals compared to 32% of the deals in H1 2022. So I think in the current market, investors are being a little bit more discerning about the terms they're willing to accept. And I think private equity sponsors, issuers and borrowers are becoming a bit more cautious about how they approach the market. As I said, they're more often than not willing to focus more on pricing um, and don't want to create extra noise by pushing for more aggressive terms uh, where they don't actually need that flexibility. So I think a lot more work is done in terms of pre-sounding investors and to just get a feedback on what will actually clear the market. Thanks, Brian. That's really interesting. Um, so are investors pushing back on, on aggressive terms? Yeah, um, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting story. I think that there has been pushback on, on some deals. But as I said, I think investors tend to have done a lot of work in the market beforehand. Um, they're not necessarily pushing for the most aggressive terms, and it depends very much on the nature of the credit. So in bonds, we only saw pushback on four deals, which as you can see from this chart is well down from what we saw in uh, the first half of 2022, but it's broadly in line with what we saw in the first half of 2021. And I think this is probably due to the large proportion of bonds that were issued to refinance existing debt which is where the covenants were substantially the same as those being refinanced. Also, when we look at good quality deals uh, with strong credit metrics, I think whether a lot of investors who are looking to invest in those that relatively small number of quality deals, then the issuers that have solid credit stories are able to incorporate aggressive terms without risking any pushback. And um, just uh, by, for, by way of information, the pushback that we saw in those deals uh, included removing the pick your poison option, uh, reducing the contribution debt from 200 times to 100, 200% uh, to 100%, and capping adjustments to EBITDA for cost savings and synergies. Um, for, for loans, the, the story is slightly different. The pushback was far more frequent than in bonds. Um, but as you can see in this chart, it appears to have fallen from a high of 56% in 22, 56% uh, of deals in 2022 to 37% of deals. But I think this is a little bit misleading because of the, the number of uh, add-ons and, and deals being done on the same terms. Um, so if we exclude those add-on facilities, the figure actually increases to 55% of deals. And that's more in line with 2022 and much higher than in 2020 and 2021. So in terms of the areas where we've seen the most pushback on loans, um, it tends to be on tightening up of value leakage and debt incurrence. Um, obviously, investors are have a more heightened focus on, on margin, yield protection and pricing. Um, and in some deals, they were pushing for the removal of more aggressive uh, calculation flexibilities. I think in amend and extend transactions, 
investors need to be particularly aware that there can be significant available capacity for incurrence of ratio-based debt and making uh, restricted payments due to the fact that there's been some deleveraging since the closing of the original financing. Um, so, and, and also another thing to bear in mind is that there could be significant accrued capacity under the 50% CNI builder basket. So it was interesting to note that investors on two loans successfully pushed back for the reduction of ratio levels for debt incurrence and restricted payments to more closely match the, the leverage at the time of the amendment. And they also uh, changed the start date of the 50% CNI basket to be reset to the amendment date so that all of the accrued capacity from the original closing to the amendment date was no longer included. So I, I think holistically the takeaway is that um, in this market, the extent to which investors are willing to push back is very much dependent on the nature of the credit. Uh, as you mentioned, EG Group was one of those amended extends that was a little bit more troublesome and they're reported to have a lot of pushback uh, on some of the terms that they, they made in order to clear the market. And it took them quite a while to complete syndication. Thank you, Brian. Yes, I remember that too. Um, just um, to remind um, everybody watching that if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to use the Q&A. Um, meanwhile, um, Brian, uh, have there been other innovations or developments in terms of covenants and documentation? Well, I think um, for, Investors to the relief, I, th I think it's been a relatively uh, boring period in terms of uh, new innovations, but, but one area where I think we're seeing a little bit, a bit of development is actually on lender protections. Um, I think investors are becoming increasingly aware of the potential for companies to use uh, liability management techniques of the type that we've seen in the US on deals like J. Crew, Serta Simmons and PetSpot. Um, and although those, the use of those techniques in the US has been widespread. They haven't really found favor yet in Europe. Um, but it, although I, I should mention, it's worth noting that Lycra uh, completed a refinancing in May using a quasi J. Crew style drop down where they, they moved their intellectual property into a, an unrestricted subsidiary. Um, so, just on that note, uh, J. Crew blockers were included in. 33% of bonds in 2023, and that's compared to 7% in 2022. So it's a significant uplift. It was also included in 20% of loans in 2023, and that's up from 19% in 2022. Not such a significant increase, but it's still very prevalent. And Pat Smart and Chewy protections <clears throat> have become very common in the US. But we haven't really seen them. Uh, in European deals to date. But uh, in the first half of 2023, 2023, in deals where there were non-wholly owned, where non-wholly owned subsidiaries were exempt from granting guarantees or having their shares granted as security, 19% of those deals included some form of Chewy protection. Thank you very much for that, Brian. That was really interesting. Um, so that brings our actual, the, the uh, beginning bit of our webinar to a close. Um, thank you, um, Brian and Charlie, for your discussion. Um, and we'll now move on to the Q&A uh, to, uh, to answer any questions. Let's see what we have um, from our attendees so far. Um, I think I'll go for question one, which is, um, what do you think will be the outlook um, for the rest of the year? And, and I'll, I'll have a go at answering that. Um, so basically, I mean, as everybody knows, activity for the rest of the year is likely to be um, dominated by A&Es, refinancings and small add-ons. Um, so in addition to the two um, take private LBOs that may come to the market uh, shortly after the summer, following the, the um, uh, software AG deal that's in the market now, uh, financing also has to be raised for acquisitions of um, Vantage Towers, Deutsche Telekom, which are, are businesses where they'll be highly levered and a lot of debt will have to be raised. Um, and um, there are a number of small, uh, well, there are a number of, um, there's a small number of MA processes that, it's on, that are ongoing, including for the acquisitions of WFS, uh, WebHelp, and WorldPay. But some of the current um, MA activity is led by strategic players rather than uh, private equity. Um, and, and there's still some valuation mismatch, as we said earlier, between buyers and sellers, which is making it hard for M&A uh, deals and LBOs to get across the line. 
Um, and obviously, even after these the deals start happening, it will take a while for um, the debt to come to the primary market. Um, another expected deal um, that's going to come soon is an A&E for a uh, Finnish uh, social and healthcare provider, um, Mehilainen, um, which should come soon. Um, and obviously, there's a significant maturity war in 2025 and 2026 uh, for both bonds and loans um, uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and, you know, on the, in terms of A&Es for loans, um, many of the kind of uh, easier capital structures have, have been dealt with and extended. And now you're going to have to kind of deal with the larger and more challenging ones where we've talked about Buckfield and EG Group, which are a bit more tricky. Um, and now there'll be others possibly similar to that coming as well. Um, there, let me look at some other questions uh, we might have. Um, let's go for this one. What are the options for companies that were that are unable to refinance at the currently elevated rates that we are seeing? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so obviously, if you're a, a company who was previously paying 4% and you're looking at refinancing, as we said, in the first half of the 2023 uh, market for a single B-rated company, that was an average of 8.7%, um, which is obviously you're almost doubling your interest burden for that um, individual uh, portion of your capital structure that you're trying to refinance. So we might see some more creative options. Um, one answer is uh, equity support from the shareholder, um, which will definitely increase the likelihood that refinancing in the open market will go through. Um, an example of this was Adler Pelza. Um, their recent refinancing, it was looking like it would definitely be unlikely um, without the support uh, via an equity injection. Um, it's actually a company that we followed for a while um, in July last year. Uh, we published a waterfall analysis, which actually highlighted that the bonds were not covered and that the company would definitely need equity support um, in order to get uh, a refinancing in the open market. Um, and exactly, that's exactly what they did. Um, they got the equity injection um, just as the time to address the maturities were running out. Uh, and they came to market with the equity support and offered a very high yield, which was around 12% or was 12% um, in order to get the deal done. Um, However, a problem definitely arises when shareholders are unlikely to support, uh, and that's why we all, we spend a lot of time as well analyzing companies to understand uh, owners' commitments and the shareholding, um, how much an owner has invested, how much they've extracted in terms of dividends, um, because that would give us an indication of whether the sponsor or shareholders would walk away or exit in the uh, in the event that they're a private equity company who's held this um, company for a long duration. Um, and that would obviously lower the chance that um, a company would be able to get equity support and refinance. Um, as an alternative, um, an issuer would the, an issuer can engage with creditors early. Uh, that's one option uh, to find an amicable solution that we would call a soft solution. Um, for example, a debt exchange. Um, if it's in the loan market, they can use A and E's, which we've talked about here, in order to push maturities out in return for maybe a. 1% coupon uplift in a fee. Um, and that can buy some time for credit metrics to really improve before launching uh, full refinancing in the open market at a later date, which is potentially uh, a time when rate, rates may have come down. Um, and that's kind of what we're thinking that the French cleaning service company Italian uh, is going to do buy time and then go for a refinancing at a later date. Um, alternatively, there's other uh, pretty bespoke options. You can raise funds from other capital solutions providers and direct lenders um, or try to place a loan in, in the loan market if you're trying to um, refinance a bond. Um, and in the worst case scenario, obviously, you'd go for a hard restructuring. Um, but that's where our primary analysis of uh, the analysis of the primary market becomes relevant, um, which we try, which we do for around half the issuances in the European bond market. Um, that's where we try to estimate what a sustainable capital structure would actually look like. Um, so we check what a sustainable interest coverage ratio is. For example, that might be around three times for a single B-rated name. Um, and then you apply the interest rate observed in the market today, which is the 8.7%, I said, for single B-rated names, depending on sector, obviously. Um, and then with those two variables, we can estimate the max amount of gross debt that an issuer can sustain. And knowing the gross, uh, the max amount of debt, then you can estimate the estimated debt haircut that's required, um, and therefore 
uh, the recovery that existing creditors will get in restructuring. So there's a lot of options if if companies can't bear those yields, and it remains to be seen in the second half of the year whether we'll see uh, much more of these trends. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I'll go for another question. Um, do you think that the elevated yields that you've shown for the first half of this year will continue in the second half? Um, it's definitely too early to say um, for uh, the, the month so far. Um, we're in the 26th now. Um, there's been pretty variable um, pricing in the market. Um, we saw sevens, we saw nines. Um, however, just uh, on Monday, Iceland came out with uh, their new uh, refinancing of their fixed rate. Um, and that's a company that's choosing to refinance now, despite the elevated yields, um, due to the fact that the market's being open. And, and I think this is the point that you alluded to earlier, Beatrice, where companies will actually choose to bear the higher yields or higher prices they have to offer investors, um, due to the fact that the market is open now and they don't want to get into a situation where, like 2021, they can't refinance. Um, and so it looks like they're choosing now because the market is open, despite the fact that they're having to pay 11% um, in order to get investors to roll over. Um, and to be honest, that looks like a de facto amend in exchange, but for a bond. Uh, but it's been done by offering investors a very healthy 11%, um, which is a, a pretty high yield already. So um, it remains to be seen. But based on evidence so far, it seems that the elevated rates are definitely here to stay, at least um, for the rest of the year. But there might still be some increase um, in the average, um, which is what we saw from Q1 to Q2 uh, of uh, this year's today. So um, too early to say, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, going to a, another question. Um, is there a large volume of total maturities that are left to be addressed? Um, so as we said, there's 52 billion um, of total maturities to be addressed uh, in the next year. Um, that's for the high yield bond market. Um, however, and and as I said, it's going to be very tricky um, for issuers to actually, for given the appetite for the high yield bond market, for that 52 billion um, next year to actually um, come to market. But yeah, the total volume is for this, for uh, maturing in the next year is far in excess of the 33 billion that we saw to date. So um, that goes back to our point about the investor appetite might actually. Um, not remain sufficient for the quantity of deals that um, would actually need to get over the line in order to push out these 2023 and 2024 maturities. Okay, um, that makes sense. Um, I, I have another question here, which I don't know if we have um, an answer for, but I'll, I'll ask you, Charlie, and if, if not, we can just kind of respond um, by email uh, to the uh, attendee later. Um, do you have any data on um, demand for new high yield bond issues in terms of over and under subscription, for example? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, yeah. Do you have any data on demand for new high yield bond issues in terms of over and under subscription? Um, is that, I assume that means um, for those which occurred in July? Um, uh, so we don't have um, data for those which uh, actually occurred in July. However, if we go back to um, what we talked about for uh, the year to date, um, we can see that, yeah, over a third were actually um, oversubscribed. Um, and this is not just an effect from the upsizing um, of the uh, of the actual issuance. There was also a tightening of the uh, average tightening of uh, the yield from the initial price talk of um, that was 0.3% on average. So we don't we don't have data from book runners, which tells us like, you know, this deal was oversubscribed. We don't have any data like that. But what we infer is that given the third of issuances were upsized and the average tightening of the yield at that issuance from the price talk was 0.3% um, for the year to date. Those are two pretty large factors which point to the fact that oversubscription, um, given the supply level and the high yield market, was um, definitely quite rife in the year to date. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll, I'll I'll make this one the last question. Um, you you say that investor appetite has been strong, however, CLO issuance is down. How do these two points correlate? 
So um, the two points are, are linked in the fact that they're, there's, they're explaining that there's an equilibrium between the demand and the, the supply side um, for the high yield market. If you think that um, the CLO issuance feeds the demand side um, of the market and the need to refinance feeds the supply side. Um, and the need to refinance is obviously, the supply side is obviously affected by the higher rates as well. Um, so uh, CLO issuance has been down, but we've seen that uh, investor appetite has still been strong. Um, and CLO, uh, CLO issuances have obviously been uh, down this year. Um, however, uh, this is obviously as a result of the fact that um, the equity component of the CLO is just not a good place to be. Um, you're you're taking on high risk, however, and you're not going to see double digit returns in the equity component uh, if you're issuing a CLO these days. Um, so why wouldn't you why wouldn't you as an investor go directly to the bond market where you can get um, you can invest in Adler Pels at, at low leverage with equity support and get twelve percent. So I think there's a lot more direct participation, which is ignoring the fact that CLO issuance has been down. However, as we've said, there's a lot of big maturities coming up in the high yield market and um, whether there being a low amount of CLO issu issuance is able to support the amount of refinancings that need to get done, um, we might see that uh, supply for refinancing might outweigh the demand in the market in the second half of the year. Thank you very much, Charlie, for all those super interesting insights. Um, so I think we'll, we'll bring the webinar to a close now. Um, so thank you again uh, to Charlie. Thank you, Brian, um, for a really great conversation. Um, we're we're going to have to kind of wind up because we're running out of time. But before we go, just a few closing comments from me. Um, uh, as a reminder, Reorg is a provider of credit data, uh, analysis, and intelligence. Um, a replay of this webinar will be available on the website by um, close of business tomorrow, tomorrow at the latest for Reorg subscribers. Um, please, please also do fill in the uh, feedback survey and also um, uh, re register if you might be interested in participating in a webinar as a panelist in the future. Um, and uh, thank you to all who joined us today. Um, and thank you again, Brian and Charlie, for the conversation. Thanks. Bye. Bye.